at this time, I would like to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today, uh, Mr. Philip Mahan. Philip Mahan is a longtime participant in information technology and holds certifications in security, privacy, audit, cloud security, and several application specific areas. He has spoken at conferences ranging from local to international audiences. His talk today is entitled Privacy and Cybersecurity in the Age of the Internet of Things. At this time, uh, will you please welcome Mr. Philip Mahan. Thank you very much. Good morning. Buenos dias. Aloha. Shalom. So when I go to presentations, I often wonder what the presenter is going to talk to me about. What kind of journey are we going to take? So I thought, I'll come up with a nice little scale. As you'll notice here, left brain, right brain. This, this talk is going to be a lot of right brain area. Concepts, what you can do in the workplace, not so much the ones and zeros of the left brain mind. And if you're looking for really technical information in this presentation, sorry. You're getting enough of that, the ones and zeros and the zeros to Fs in the rest of your talks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a little journey. We're going to have some fun, talk about privacy, cybersecurity in the Internet of Things age. So today is October 21st, other than being the day that Marty McFly came forward to. <laughs> it is a very important day. In 1797, the 44-gun USS Constitution was launched out of Boston Harbor. In 1512, Martin Luther joined the theological faculty of the University of Wittenberg. And in 1959, the Guggenheim Museum was open to the public. The Guggenheim, of course, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. So what does this have to do with privacy and cybersecurity? Absolutely nothing. But when I was asked to come speak today, I was told, we need you to come and give a group of people some information. I have now done that. If I had a mic, I would drop it. Oh, sorry. This is my example for the difference between compliance and reality. I have now complied with what I agreed to because I doubt that anybody in here knew it was Manford Man's birthday. Did anybody know today was Manford Man's birthday? The last presentation I gave was on one of his band members' birthday, so it works out perfectly. You know, synchronicity is a great thing. So I told you this was going to be a right brain presentation, didn't I? All right. So while the left brain is usually out counting its folds, we're going to be over on the other side. But I am going to step one foot into the left brain with a standard disclaimer. Now my lawyers are happy. May you live in interesting times. I was told that this was a Chinese curse. I had it in my bag of sayings for years. It is not actually a Chinese curse. There's something similar, but it's in Chinese. I don't know that. As a southerner from the southern United States, I have a heritage of storytelling. My great-grandmother could tell a great tale. I was a kid, and as such, I wanted to be anywhere but listening to an old lady, just the way it is. But age tempers things. I am now a half a century old. I have been in technology for half my life. I started out in this business upgrading 16 megahertz machines to 20 megahertz machines. 
These two items that are up the picture on here, these are actually things I own, and I know that they're already way outdated. So, you know. The reason I say this is because I've been in this business long enough to know that every wave is the final wave. You will never need a hard drive bigger than 80 megs, ever. Profs will be the email system of record for eternity. All right. <laughs> With the technology that we've got today moving forward, it makes our lives really challenging. Physical security, information security, privacy, when you've got an iron that's on the internet, it's gonna make our lives pretty intriguing going forward. Now I no longer have an eight track tape in my car but I do have a CD player. I also have a jack for my iPod, but still, we start looking at where technology is going, and unless we keep an eye on where we're going and where we've been, it's gonna make security nigh impossible. I mentioned my great-grandmother. She used to tell a story about those crazy Wright boys that thought they could fly. She lived to see a space shuttle launch. Pretty cool. So what are we going to be talking about in 20 years? So we look at what's connected in your life. There's the standard. There's your laptops that everybody's got out open reading your email. There's some of us who still have desktops at home, rock it old school. There are the things that you know where they belong in the infrastructure. We know where the routers are. We know where the load balancers are. We can watch those. But is it really going to help us in the future when we're wearing our technology? It's something to think about. If you take a long look at where you are and where you've gone, it puts things into perspective. Now, there are those that say, the lawyers should be the first ones up against the wall when the revolution comes. How many people agree? How many people actually agree with me that before you put the lawyers up there, we need the marketers? <laughs> cloud. There is no cloud. It's somebody else's computer. The Internet of Things is the same thing. I've also seen IIoT making its rounds, the industrial Internet of Things. Really? That's lovely. We've got to take a step back from the marketers and go, I can't explain the Internet of Things to my mother. She goes, oh, that's where there's stuff on the internet, right? I'm like, yes. So how do I tell her that she's going to have to take her iron and do malware updates? Have you seen this iron that's going on the internet? A guy has thought it's a good idea to put a scanner on an iron so you can look at the universal tags of what kind of cloth is it that you're ironing and adjust the temperature accordingly? Do we really need that as an attack vector? I don't think so, but hey. So I am proposing that we start talking about the Internet of Things as non-traditional endpoints. Because that's something people can get their head around. It's like, well, okay, an endpoint is going to be your laptop, an endpoint is going to be your phone. This is just one of those things that doesn't fit in that nice little category. You're still going to have to treat it as if it's a computer because it is. You look at some of the technology that, that is coming out and what people think that should be on the internet. Your smart house. 
Uh, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday who was telling me he diagnosed a problem where somebody's heater was putting off just loads of traffic going out the door. It's like, well, you really don't need that kind of traffic. Found out that somebody had gone into the router and passed and was using their internet-enabled heater as an attack vector. Beautiful. Now, I have Wireshark. I watch all the traffic that goes in my house. Now, there are times when my wife says, take off the tinfoil hat and back away from the edge. This is one of those times. I go, all right, I'm, I understand that. But will we have privacy professionals sitting around in five years asking questions about PII and PHI, Personally, personal ironing information, and personal hummus information? Because if my fridge is on the internet, I do not want foreign nationals knowing I just ate hummus that was 10 days expired. The NSA has no right to know that I've gone off my diet. Just doesn't. This is a huge convenience. If I can turn water on and off, if I can check and see if my heater's on, if I can adjust the temperature before I get in, if I can turn lights on randomly in my house and sort of evade intruders, these are all really good things. I married an artist, and she doesn't even like all the clocks in the house to have the same time on them, because she doesn't like these things thinking together. <laughs> she will not let home automation anywhere near us, and I'm okay with that. Because I don't need a Nigerian prince sending me money through my heating system. I don't need my iron or my washing machine sending my dating profile. For the record, I do not have a dating profile. I am married. Ashley Madison users, no. <laughs> As Spider-Man said, actually it was Uncle Ben that said, with great power comes great responsibility. If you've got great power, through the connected items in your house, you have a responsibility to watch these. Now, there was another conversation that went on earlier today that I heard, and they were saying, well, end users just don't care for the most part, which I have to admit is mostly true. So are you going to patch your iron and your washing machine and your refrigerator? Probably not. So what we have to do is we have to talk to our families and become tech support again. Isn't that something we've all wanted? Now, in looking at what you have connected in your life today, you ask one question. Does it move data? Of course it does. If it didn't move data, why would you put it on the internet? Other than to say, I have an iron that's on the internet. I rock. I don't. I'm, I'm just a sad, lonely man. If you're watching what goes on, you'll know how to protect yourself. There is a case that has been made to me in the past that we have no such thing as privacy. All of our data is already out there, and we're doomed. Is there anybody in this room that actually believes that? A couple. So what you do is you take matters into your own hands. You adjust the data that goes out there. Now, granted, if you update your warranty cards and send them in, and you say that your median salary is over two million, your junk mail, the quality at least, goes up considerably. Move your business to the Cayman Islands. You know, it's like, we have tax shelters, yachts. If you don't watch what you're doing, you get taken. 
Now, I will tell you this, I have lied to the FBI. I am saying that on camera. I am expecting a squad any moment. I'm a member of InfraGuard, which is FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and private sector businesses to protect critical infrastructure. The speaker that's coming up after me is the current president of our local chapter. Nice guy. But I lied to the FBI because in this system, when you put your security questions, you get to tell them what the answers are. I recently had my password expire by 28 hours because I miscounted. And you know I wait till the very last second to change my passwords. And so I had to call. And the agent that was on the line that drew the short straw and was having to answer questions said to me, I need your mother's maiden name. I paused, said, well, that could be a problem. I do not think I would lie to the FBI, but I probably did. There was silence on the other end for a moment. I said, let me tell you what my real mother's maiden name is, but please give me a second try if I don't get it. She goes, uh-huh. I said, here is my mother's maiden name. Boom. She goes, that's not what we have. I went, okay, so I do lie to the FBI. She was not amused. I said, but the answer is this. She asked me three more questions. I answered all of them because now that I knew I lied, I knew the answers. I got reset. So you can take some modicum of control back over what you put out there. Because although my mother's maiden name, Ferguson, is really easy to find if you want to look, what I chose as my mother's maiden name is here. Now, the downside for that is when you lie like that, you have to then remember what your answers are. Now, I give a different answer for banking than I would for the FBI, than I would for regular retail. So if you did find out what name I gave to the FBI, it still wouldn't help you on my bank accounts. Because I know it's really easy to find some of this information out. What high school did you go to? Oh yeah, right, that's tough. There are many, many avenues that you can take to at least get some control over your privacy. Now, I am just a simple, simple, natural person. Who here knows the difference between a natural and an unnatural person? Lots of you. And what is it? Corporations. Hoo-ya! I am a natural person. If I wanted to incorporate, I could become natural and unnatural. I might even get a part on The Walking Dead. We remember it's going to be all about data. So in looking at unnatural people, I came up with lenses to look through. If you've ever read Trees, T-R-I-Z, which is uh, Gerhard Altschuler's methodology for problem solving, you'll see that every problem can be broken down into one of maybe 120 problems. There's a book by Mark Fox called Da Vinci and the 40 Answers where he actually puts it down to seven, or sorry, 40. I've come down to seven in how you can protect data. So, if you're familiar with the OSI model, you understand that everything goes bottom up. I tend to go from the wire to the sky. If you know the value of the data that you're protecting, it makes it a whole lot easier to protect because the last time I checked, putting your company phone book behind a man trap, three biometric readers, and a retina scan, is not really cost effective. And when you go to talk to this, you know, the C-suite and you say, I need $2.8 million, why? Well, our phone book is out there and somebody told me they could spear fish. It's not gonna go over very well. So we all have to know the value of the data. I think this working group specifically is going to be a group of people who will know this backwards, forwards, and upside down because how do you know it's being abused if you don't know where the money is? So I think you got this covered.
Next layer up is physical security because if you can't protect it physically, you can't protect it through the air. If somebody gets access to my washing machine and sets it where when I tell it to, to go uh, cold, it does hot, now everything shrinks. And we know that's coming. How many people are mad enough at you to readjust your iron so when you, say, when you show it silk, it does cottons? I mean, really, this is hideous stuff. Then the CIA, I've already mentioned the FBI, so I have to mention the CIA for at least a moment, then we'll get to NSA and secret, oh, uh, sorry, wrong CIA, confidentiality, integrity, accessibility. Everybody that's taken that CISSP class, that's been drilled into your head backwards, forwards, inside out. Once again, everybody in this room is golden here. Then we have auditability. The auditors are our left brain friends. I told you I was gonna stay out of the left brain for a while, but if you can't prove a control, you do not have a control. Because everybody in the corporate world is looking at compliance. We all know compliance is all they care about. That's what they fund. If you really want security, and this is a group that wants the reality and the security, so you're working harder than most folks, but the, from the corporate side, pretty reasonable to say, I need my PCI, I need my SOC 2, you know. I loved the days of the SAS 70 Type 1, where your password control could be, we don't use passwords. And you passed. I love, sorry. Privacy concerns, this is becoming a much hot, hotter topic. But if you don't have the rest of these at the bottom, you can't get to privacy. Now, Safe Harbor, may it rest in peace. <laughs> if you read the judicial review last night, there is now legislation going through that will make it possible for the Europeans to sue us as American companies if we breach privacy. Uh, I've spent many years studying privacy, and I know the American version of privacy is, we'll use your data appropriately. <laughs> Trust us. The EU says it's a fundamental human right. I wonder sometimes, with all the surveillance cameras in the UK, if it's a fundamental human right. But that's my political soapbox, and I wasn't here to go on to that, so we're going to skip on. Specific business concerns. If you don't know your sector, if you do not know your business, if you do not know those lines that your bosses will and will not cross, your data is at risk. I have worked for companies where people's risk appetite was much bigger than mine. And I would say, okay, here are the 40 things that are about to happen to you if you move forward with this, but if you're willing to risk it, they said, yeah, we'll never get breached. We'll never get hit. Like, my job would be to immediately walk, leave the room, and start putting up countermeasures and start putting up the things that I was going to need to do to bring the company back once all these bad things that I've told them were going to happen happened. This is a very important slice. So information retention, how long am I keeping my data? There's a lot of arguments. I was a Lotus Notes administrator for Motorola's global software group. Please forgive me. We had a gentleman who could tell you what day we had cake for the February birthdays five years previous. All I had to do was look it up in his email. Gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs of data. And we were like, dude, you can only do two gigs on this database, and then it corrupts. Oh yeah, I've got five databases. I have also worked for a company that had a strict policy of deleting everything after 30 days. Kept nine days offline. 21 days near line, that was it. 
They were like, if we get sued or if the cops come, we say, no, this has been our policy for the last eight years. Sorry, sound guy. Which was fine until they needed to cover their own bots. And they was like, yeah, I wish we had that for a little longer. These are all decisions that are being made probably outside of this room. We should be in those meetings, if at all possible. We should be whispering in the ears of the people that are making these decisions. I think we all know that, but it's one of those, I'll, I'll talk in a few minutes about one of the more easy ways to get into those rooms. And then, of course, the keys of the kingdom, the data. So I showed this chart for a couple of years until I realized this is for unnatural people. Well, for natural people, works the same. Personal value of information, because although a corporation is involved in making that kind of cash, and that's really, it's the bottom line to them, what information do you really want to keep secret? I got some pictures from when I'm like five years old before braces and contacts that I really don't want in the public domain. My grandmother, you know, she thinks they're cute and trying to put them up on Facebook, and I'm like, no. If you don't know the value of what information you have and you're giving away, it's hard to protect it. The physical security side is basically the same thing. I want to make sure you don't get my wallet. I want to make sure you don't get my passport. I have the RFID blocking stuff. If I could, I'd walk around in a Faraday cage because, you know, they're just, they're cool. A couple of paint cans, some chicken wire, aluminum foil. So, yeah. Sorry. So we already talked about the personal hummus information. Oh, that's healthcare. Sorry, wrong one. Uh, you know, it's always fun because my wife, although she's a Luddite, and I use her in a lot of stories, she knows she's going to watch this later. I will probably go missing soon. She will look and go, I'm not signing this because you didn't give me a privacy policy. She follows her data. Everybody should do this. If we would, as a whole, kind of show people it's important to not just sort of give your data away. Maybe two years ago, there was a guy in London giving away candy bars for personal information. And people would look. He said in the study, people would look down and go, isn't this information that you could steal my identity with? And the guy with the clipboard looked down and goes, huh, yeah, I guess I could. And they would still give it to him. Here's your candy bar. Follow your data. Because if you don't know where it's going, you can't stop it from getting to places you don't want. Now, here's my favorite one. Strictly because of Safe Harbor, may it rest in peace, choice and consent. The whole foundation of the International Association of Privacy Professionals comes down to the right to be forgotten and choice and consent. I have the right for that query to go away. I also have friends that if I have an untimely death will wipe my browser history and shoot my computer multiple times before anybody can get, first responders can get there because, you know, we choose what we put out. It's important to watch what we put out. I do not want my junior high transcripts to be floating around somewhere. Not that I was a particularly bad student or anything, but that's just way too long to keep stuff on me. We think about information retention. If we know what people are keeping, we can take a little more control over what we're doing. And as the people that are helping remove abuse, if we can start talking to folks about how long they keep some of this data, why do you keep this? Because we may want it. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. And then, of course, your personal data. Now, 
I was talking before about the information retention. That leads us to rules, because you have to have rules about these things. I posit that there are three basic things that you should know when either reading rules or writing rules. There's a gentleman named Jeffrey Ritter who wrote a book called Achieving Digital Trust that just recently came out. He has seven. I haven't gotten there that far. I'm still reading. Uh, I may change this. But the three basic rules that we should all be thinking of, and it's pretty easy to tell these to people who don't understand technology, is what am I supposed to do or not do? Who does this protect or what does this protect? And who's the enforcer? It's pretty simple. Because if you look at things like PCI, PCI protects the consumer. I was waiting for somebody to throw something. Protects the credit card companies. We all know that. So when you're looking at writing rules and you know that this is a compliance piece, you're probably going to look at that and go, we have to be PCI compliant either A, because our uh, clients say we have to, or we take credit cards, and if we're not compliant, they can stop us from taking credit cards. I worked for a company at one point that looked at how much it was going to cost them to change all their systems to become PCI compliant and looked at the fines. They understood business value and they went, shh, write the check. And they would pay the fines month after month. It's like, oh, yeah, we don't care. Until the PCI council got smart and said, yeah, we're going to take it where you can no longer take credit cards at all. And they went, yeah, so we're going to pay the $2 million and fix that. The most important piece here is the bottom, I think. How many lawbreakers do we have in the room? Good, good, honest people. I say this because generally when I ask this question, I get no hands come up until I go, oh, so everybody drove the speed limit here. And then people's hands go. So. In Atlanta, Georgia, the speed limit is nine miles over the posted speed limit. You will not get a ticket for eight miles over, unless you're in one or two counties that have the speed traps, and then it's a half a mile over and you're gonna get uh, Smokey the Bear knock on the door. We know this as Atlantans. So every one of us drives eight, nine miles over the speed limit, because we can. If you are writing rules that you expect people to follow, you need to write rules that can be enforced. If you are not enforcing these things, you don't have a rule. One of the biggest smart asses that I know says all the time an unenforced rule is a suggestion, which if you look at the attribution, I say it so much I get people go, yeah, 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 we know, we know, we know. It's like, then start enforcing the bloody rules. I worked for a company where we had WebSense. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't name names, but we had a web filtering device. And I was told, you cannot have anybody, bless you, anybody vice president or higher on this filtering system. I said, okay, great. So our new policy said, if you are below vice president, you will have all of your web traffic filtered, and these are the block size. This is, you know, appropriate use and inappropriate use. They said, I said, vice president's higher. You are excluded from this rule. Now, you can't do that. You can't write it down. I was like, well, if we get sued and somebody looks at one of our policies that we don't enforce, they now can say, well, you don't enforce any of them. You can't prove you enforce any of them, so you don't have policies, so summary judgment. So we had to do that. The next day, he had, the CEO had a meeting with all of his directs and said, yeah, everybody's getting filtered, sorry, done. He knew I was that big a jerk, I was gonna block it. So, if you're watching rules, you need to think about your language. If you got a text right now that said there's water on the floor, 
you'd have no idea whether there's water on the floor. Oh God, there's water on the floor! This is the same thing with rules that we write. This is the same thing with the way we describe security and privacy in our current world. We love the FUD. When it makes it useful to us, we will imply the bottom picture. And when it's useful to us, oh yeah, no, it's, there's water on the floor. The language that we use matters. So I say this primarily because we have done a disservice to ourselves over the last 20 years. In my time in IT and in security, we have used FUD way too much. Let's scare them, we'll get the money. In the age of the Internet of Things where computers will be everywhere and anywhere, where I talked about my beginnings in technology, I had a two-button remote control that had four channels. I can now watch movies on this. If you have a Kindle and know what you're doing, you can be let into people's company, say it's just a Kindle, and suddenly now it's an Android tablet with Wi-Fi. People are going to be walking in and be able to exfiltrate if you're not careful. But our language matters. Do we talk about how things could happen, or we do, do we scare the crap out of the people with the money? I'm hoping that we can take a step back and go, okay, for non-traditional endpoints, it's important that we look at security. It's important that we know who has a recording device in their pocket. It's important to keep up with our sectors and know where things are. I doubt anybody's going to bring a washing machine into my office that's connected to the internet, but they may. I mean, we got a break room. That's that one. That one. I try and scare people sometimes with fear, uncertainty, and doubt because you can. And some people just need it. Back in Alabama in the 1800s, there was a gentleman that was the cousin of the judge, and he had shot a guy. And it's on the records that his plea was he just needed shooting. He got off. What are we enforcing? <laughs> We need to keep track of the Zeppelins. We need to watch what's coming forward in our sectors. We need to watch what's coming forward so that we can look at it and go, how are we going to stop the abuse next? This working group is a really great thing. Now, I will be honest, I had never heard of MOG before I was asked to speak. And then I started looking going, this is a pretty cool group. I'm hoping it will not be the last time I see your smiling faces. But it comes down to there is a small group of people who care. It's the folks in this room. You need to tell people that you care. You need to show people, hey, there's stuff coming down the pipe that although is really kind of scary sometimes, it's probably not going to kill us. I have one more little phrase that I use for risk. Reality includes scary knowledge. When I say don't use FUD, I'm not saying don't tell the truth. Planes fall out of the sky. Skylab could come, well, it can't, not Skylab. The ISS could come hit me right now. We live in a world where there's stuff that happens. The trick is trying to make sure you're in the right place at the right time and trying to make sure that you have control. Now, I talked before about statutes, regulations, what we need to know. It's a good idea to get to know your regulators, partly because they're good people usually, but also if you've got questions on interpretations, they're the ones to go through. When I was first asked about this topic and to come speak, I had like nine slides on the different statutes that were going on and you know, all the stuff that's, 
that's happening in the world. And I thought, you know, I'd be talking from lunch straight through dinner and still wouldn't get half of what you already know. All the, all the statutes are online. If you get to know the lawmakers, you can find out what's coming. Now, there are those that think that the internet is a series of tubes. I have a solution that I have used for a while. How many people remember in second grade learning about rain and the water cycle? Water goes up in the sky, becomes cloud, rains. It's not talking about the ionization of the atmosphere. It's not talking about really anything that's actually going on. But people can go, oh, yeah, I got that. I, I understand this is, you know, there's stuff. I got it. Any time that you can take a technological thing and shove it down to a process that may or may not actually be technically correct, but gives people a warm fuzzy, you're doing yourself a favor. If they really want to know about meteorology, they will study that. But what we need to be talking to the financial people and the CEOs and all this is like, look, this is a problem. It's surmountable. But we need to be looking at this. You need to give me cycles. You need to help me with this. Because otherwise, that rain that comes down is going to be acid rain. I found that when you mention the Wall Street Journal and their picture on the front with the coat over their head, that often helps speed that up. Makes sense. The only constant, however, is change. How many people two weeks ago were loving Safe Harbor? It's like, yeah, one group. Now I'm having to talk to DPOs in like 12 different countries in every little section and half of Germany wants something and the other half doesn't. And it, it makes life really interesting. But we can navigate this. All we have to do is put our hands on the rudder and kind of watch these regulators and talk to them in a way that they can understand and start nudging. Now, I'm not saying that you should do anything untoward. I'm not saying proposals should have $100 bills stapled on them. It's not a good thing to do. Works sometimes. Oh. Here are some of the enforcers that you should get to know. I oftentimes say, if you don't know your local cops that do cybersecurity and do the forensic side and image the drives, you're in trouble. Because if you ever need one, good luck navigating the levels. I know what the GBI does, what the FBI does, what Secret Service does, and what my local cops do. And I know which one to pick up the phone and call. Because it is not a good time to learn how to use a fire extinguisher when your house is ablaze. Know the enforcers. These are the guys that do the stuff and come and take away the bad guys. If you are one of the bad guys, they will walk you out. Now, that having been said, I thought it appropriate for this group to mention that if the FBI wants you, they will not send you an email. I had a client who got an email from the FBI saying, hey, we know you're not the John Doe we're looking for but we need you to send us your full name and your social security number, your address, and two or three other pieces of information so that we can weed you out of the thing. I got the phone call 15 minutes after he hit send. I went, yeah. It came from FBI.com, right, yeah. I'm not saying we don't have a long way to go. I'm just saying it is possible for us, with the help of these people, to drop the hammer on the people that need to have the hammer dropped on them. And when we don't know which way the hammer falls, these guys can help us determine whether we need to duck or not. We do all need to work together. 
this group is a good start. It's people talking to each other that I wouldn't have thought would talk to each other. I'll be honest, I've been sort of wandering around, listening, and this is a really good group. You should all be very proud of yourselves. There's a lot of work to do, but we can all do it. Now, part of that silver lining says that even though we're going to have devices popping up like this, there are some people working on standards, BCPs. The Underwriter Labs is working on a standard for wearable technology the same way that they were working on electricity 100 years ago. We've got groups looking at this. I think we can do it. It's just a matter of setting your sails, keeping one eye on the North Star, which is the data that we need to protect, and just moving forward. We do live in interesting times. Let's just make sure it's a blessing and not a curse.